It is not us that live for ourselves. We live for you. May you get only the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, go to Matthew 22. This is a very sobering message. Worship was wonderful. And God is constantly calling us. And this scares me. This is a very just passage that um, I don't know how else to do it, but just read. So, <clears throat> once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. I love the song done, um, Hanley Slab uh, Slabbert, I think. Maya didot mishkenotecha Adonai tzevaot. How beautiful um, are your tents, O oh Lord? And it's Psalm 80. And it's a... It's a... Uh, it's a love song. Because she goes into then Song of Solomon in, in that song. Diglo uh, alai ahava, and his flag over me is love. So he sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, and they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, Tell those who are invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and they went away. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the others seized his slaves, treated them outrageously and killed them. The king was enraged, so he sent out his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned down their city. Then he told the, his slaves, the banquet is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. So those slaves went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. But when the king came in to view the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. The man told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. There's so much to unpack here, but what the Lord is trying to say, I have a feast. I have a wedding feast, a feast of unity, a feast of rejoicing. It is the unification of Jesus and God being made one. Jesus wants us in this feast. We are being invited, this abiding. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him 
the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. 1 Peter 4.12, or 4.13, being partakers in his suffering that we may rejoice in his resurrection. It is the idea of, I don't know if you guys have ever seen nesting dolls, the Russian nesting dolls where one doll sits, uh, uh, you know, you have a whole bunch of little dolls and one sits in, in the other and, until you have one big doll. And that's we are how we are to be with Christ. Colossians 3.3, 3, your life is hid with Christ in God. It is not you, but Christ that lives in you. If you've let him in. If you've partaken. And have feasted with him. Listen, when a lamb was slaughtered, we slaughtered a ram a little bit ago. And... Uh, the incredible amount of peace that we had... It was a surreal experience. I mean, we, we thanked the Lord for the food and, and, and we slaughtered the ram. And it was no occasion other than just weeding down the flock. And uh, it, uh, there's a sense of sobriety, but there's a sense of also rejoicing that you took part with the flock. I mean, you, you took part with the sacrifice. You took part with the slaughtering. Thank you, Lord, for trains. Planes, trains, and automobiles. And it was when we started, um, then when we we were cutting up the ram, Leanne and I, we, we were cutting up the ram. I had a great time. It was, there was a rejoicing in it. It was sobering that that, lamb, that ram was alive, but now it's no longer. And that ram gave its life so that we could have sustenance. So, that's how we are with Christ, with Jesus. He suffered so we may live. But he says, not just for you, not just I suffer. I want you to walk with me. Experience the loss so you may truly understand the, the resurrection power. Look, believers need the cross preached because we don't know how to suffer loss. Unbelievers need resurrection preached. Uh, preached because they don't have life. They don't. They need life. We don't experience loss enough. We don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate what that means. It's David Wilkerson's anguish when he says, true joy comes out of a baptism of anguish. He says, ashes have to be there for, for joy to come from it. We see it all throughout nature. Romans says that all of creation is evident and manifests the character of God so that every one of them is without excuse. If you never had a Bible, all you need is creation to teach you about Jesus Christ, the suffering, the loss. But yet we take it for granted. God is telling us, he says, I want you to feast and, and share in that joy. I got better things to do. Well, the king was enraged, so he sent his troops, destroyed the murderers, and burned down their city. So the ones who were complacent and didn't care, did he destroy their city? Perhaps. But, uh, we do know that it didn't fare out for them, fare out well for them. God is inviting all of us to feast and drink of Him. Guys, partake in the difficulties of life so that you may share in 
the glories they're, they're after. And I'm not talking about end times. I'm talking... There are... There is comfort in your sorrow. There is true joy as you're walking down this difficult path. This is not religion. This is not... I come on Sunday, sing a few songs, feel good, and then carry it on the rest of the day, get the rest of the week, as if it's my own life. No, your life's not your own. Your life's in the service of Jesus Christ. It's not an easy road, but it's a good one. Because when you walk that road, you will see the salvation of God. What does Exodus say? Stand back, be silent, and see the salvation of God. Well, you better believe, well, why didn't God say stand back and, and be silent? Because Moses, in the book of Exodus, he wanted to be in the limelight, try to fix it, and kept running his mouth. Is there a witness there? Did he not want to get involved? Did he not want to say, hey, I, I got to fix this? We want to dictate our circumstances. We want to control our destiny. And God says, stop. It's not about you. I have a feast. I prepared the feast. Stop paying attention to your own thing. And then he said, invite everybody. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs 1, verse 20. <sighs> wisdom calls out in the street. Now, we, we, we know that wisdom, Jesus is wisdom. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way, without me there's no going. I'm the truth, without me there's no knowing. I'm the life. Without me, there's no growing. Okay. Thomas Akempis said that originally. Calls out in the street. She raises her voice in the public square. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. Wait a minute. Did we just not read Matthew 22? Go to the city gates. Cry out. There are Christians crying out in the city gates. How long, foolish ones, will you love ignorance? Wisdom is in terms of fearing the Lord. We know this, Proverbs 1. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So that means walk in your day, embrace the difficulties. Embrace the circumstances and say, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? If you respond to my warning or, other, or literally back to my reprimand, or when you get corrected, you turn. Then I will do what? Pour out my spirit. Joel 2, in the last days, I will what? Pour out my spirit. Why? Because there are people that repent. And teach you my words. Here's the injunction. Since I called out and you refused, extended my hand and no one paid attention, since you neglected all my counsel and did not accept my correction, I in turn will hug you. No, that's not what that says. I in turn will cry. No. I in turn will beg you to come back. No. I in turn will laugh at your calamity because I will mock when terror strikes you when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind when trouble and stress overcome you picture Noah in the ark I love Paul Washer how he says there's a hand holding back judgment and then there's another hand reaching out and one day both hands will drop 
then you will call me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but you won't find me because they hated knowledge, did not choose to fear the Lord, were not interested in my counsel, and rejected all my correction. They will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes, for the turning of away of the inexperience will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live securely and be free from the fear, not just danger, free from the fear of danger. You're not going to be afraid of COVID. You're not going to be afraid of a riot entering in your city. And you won't be afraid of somebody robbing your house. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. But when the king came in to view the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. He didn't have wedding clothes. He wasn't ready. You get wedding clothes after you're washed. Have you repented of your sin? I'm talking to the Christians. I'm talking to those who claim the name of Jesus Christ and saying that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Have you said, Lord, I'm sorry. I've not walked in your way. I've claimed you, but I've done it my own way. Have you been baptized? Left everything behind? Have you confessed your sin? Sin is missing the mark. I'm not just talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm talking about your selfishness. I'm talking about conceit. Thinking that you look better than the next person. Or Torah roots, Hebrew roots. I go to church every Sunday, read my Bible. What about your selfishness? What about your lack of love, lack of giving? What about your lack of sacrifice or your inconvenience where somebody offended you? I'm sorry, those sins are worse because they come from an air of pride. God hates that more than somebody who's just doing drugs because they're trying to cope. No, the sins of the good flesh are even worse because they're covering up that which is, it's covering up. It's, it's, it's a house of cards. Looks great, but when the spirit blows on it, it just collapses. You're not good. Romans 3, there's no one who does good. No, not one. No one seeks God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Well, you know, you know, everybody believes in Jesus nowadays. The demons believe. No one seeks God. The faith you have to trust in Jesus Christ is not yours. You have been, you, Ephesians, you have, by, you have been saved by grace through faith. And this is a gift, not of your own doing lest anyone should boast. It's not yours. It's his. Many are called, few are chosen. Have you chosen to walk that hard road? Have you chosen to take up your cross? This is not an easy message. People were invited. People are invited every day. Come, leave your simple ways and live. Proverbs 9. Come put aside your, the way you've done things. Stop trying to figure it out and start trusting. You're not good. I'm not good. He's good. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good. It's God. He's referring to himself. <clears throat> Stop trying to figure out how to keep Torah. Stop trying to figure out how to live a good life. Stop. You don't live for here. You live for eternity. You live for Jesus Christ. There are people going to hell. And if you're not careful, you may find yourself there too. Guys, now's the time to make it right. Now's the time to get right with God. Repent.
I love you. This is a hard, hard message. God wouldn't let me go on this one. Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's calling you. Take up that cross. Say, Lord, what's my cross? That I may take it up. I don't see it. Because he'll show you what it is. You will delight in it. And you will do as he asks. And you will walk a road of miracles. Not away from the cross, through the cross. I died with Christ. I'm buried with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm raised with Christ. I'm seated at his heavenly places. Don't be afraid to do stupid things. Only after you've been in that prayer closet. But then, after coming out of that prayer closet, you know you're clothed with power. Give your offering of your heart. Don't try to figure out how to obey the Bible. It ain't going to work. Seek the Lord. Jesus, how do I obey you? Because the last command says, do all that I command you. Which literally means the Holy Spirit will speak to, to you behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. If you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you're not, you better get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because you can't even obey Jesus without his Holy Spirit in you. Don't even try. You'll fail. Every time. You will not have that peace. And it will burn in you. And you'll wonder, why is this a... Why is this not working? And it's a simple question. Lord Jesus, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Please, I receive it. Burn me up. And then the Holy Spirit will reveal Christ in you. Then you, can, you will want to worship him. You'll want, you will beg, oh God, where's your wedding? You will want it. No one will have to tell you, know the Lord. That's what the scriptures say. No one will have to tell you that. No one will have to say, go read your Bible. Because you'll want to love Jesus. And spend time with him. Just like a bride wants to spend time with her husband. Love him. He's worthy of it all. Father in heaven, I've delivered my soul. I, I, I don't know what else to say. But I trust that whatever words were spoken will penetrate to our hearts, bear your fruit of Christ-likeness, and just transform us, O oh Jesus. Lord, to those who are listening, I pray that they will be challenged in Jesus' name. Amen.